OK, first I want to let you see what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. So this week, week 15, uh, I will be talking to you about irrealism and animation. Uh, we're going to be watching The Emperor's New Groove from 2000. Next week, uh, OK, so this week was supposed to be originally the last week of instructor prepared content. So originally next week was supposed to be a student chosen film. And then uh, week 17 uh, was supposed to be. Um, oh yes, because of the midterms. So like we weren't supposed to have something to do next week. Uh, so I had to add something. Right, and week 17 was supposed to be final projects, but that was canceled too. OK, so instead week 16, uh, I've added a new unit. Uh, we'll be talking about melodrama, Sanqing, Tong Su Ju, and silent film. And I chose a film called The Artist. You'll notice that it's a recent film. It's probably the most recent silent film that was ever made. And then week 17, one of your classmates nominated a film to watch. And since she was the only person to choose a film, so we're going to watch that movie if I can find it and if I can find Chinese subtitles. I took a very brief look online and I think it's possible. So we're going to watch that movie on week 17. I will not watch it first. We're all going to watch it together. That should be fun. Uh, and then after watching that movie. Um, so that week. There will be no lecture at the beginning. We're just going to jump straight into the movie. And then after the movie ends, I will talk about the final exam. Uh, so I will. So next week when I'm sure of the details, I will tell you when the exam lecture will begin. So uh, so that you don't miss out on the lecture. And then week 18, uh, we're going to watch something fun. It, this unit week 18 will not be on the final exam. It's just that we have to do something because week 18 is no longer final exam week. Uh, and so I chose a pre-code film. Pre-code is an era of American film uh, roughly during the 1920s and early 1930s. And I'll talk a bit more about that on week 18. And the film I chose is a romantic comedy, so the theme of the week will be talking about romance. So that's the rest of the semester. Now, this week we're talking about irrealism. I have to admit this will probably be a short lecture because as the original final unit of the semester, I had planned to talk about something that I myself am still thinking about. So at this point, irrealism is at the limits of my knowledge about film. And I'm hoping that we can discuss and think about this together. And so if you have ideas on this topic, you are also very welcome to share them now or on the final exam, because realism will also be part of the final exam. Last week we talked about realism and irrealism as whether or not we, the audience, can enter into the world of the film. If we jumped into that world, would it feel real? Are we looking at it from the inside as if we are one of the characters or are we looking at it from the outside as just a performance? We're just looking at people walking around doing things. And I mentioned that 
one of the most common places where realism. Uh, let's say defaults into irrealism when realism fails and becomes irrealism is at the end of the movie. And this is because the structure of the film uh, leads up to a certain kind of ending. And if the ending does not fit the film that preceded it, we are often jarred out of the film world. We're often like surprised or we're suddenly reminded that we're actually just watching people walking around doing things instead of like uh, people who have inner lives and who care about what happens in their world. Today I want to examine the same division from the opposite side. Some films do a very good job of creating realism in the meaning that we are using here, despite many fantastical or unrealistic elements. And so I wanted to think through with you today how these films are able to get away with using so much unrealistic stuff and yet still create a feeling of realism. Uh, so the most common or I guess well known example would be a Marvel film, right? So many different elements of a Marvel film just are completely unrealistic. And yet when we watch them or when we watch most of them, uh, we have an inner understanding of the characters and we feel why they care about what they're doing. So it does create a sense of realism despite all of the fantastical elements. I think that in this case, it's probably because most Marvel films are focused on those characters, like the superpowers, the supervillains, all of the crazy CGI stuff are sort of the background environment. And against that background, the characters have to find a way to overcome the obstacle preventing them from saving the day. And usually, or at least in many cases, that obstacle is a personal relationship. Whether it's a relationship between a superhero and an ordinary civilian, or between two or more superheroes, or maybe between a superhero and themselves. Like they're struggling against an inner obstacle, a psychological obstacle. And so for th these kinds of stories, because underneath the costume and the superpowers, it's more or less a human character. So whatever these characters think about and feel and go through, we too can relate. We too can understand and empath uh, empathize. Now we also have uh, other kinds of unrealistic films. For instance, the musical, In Ju. I'm sure you've noticed by now that in daily life, people don't suddenly jump up and sing and dance. So when we watch a musical and uh, we're not just enjoying the performance, but we can also feel the emotion of the characters. Why? Why are we so easily able to accept such an unrealistic situation? Now, of course, for some musicals, we can't. Some of them are just performances for our entertainment. Uh, I'm talking about musicals that invite us into their world where the music and song and dance feel very natural. Now, one answer is a very cheap answer, which is that some musicals are built around the idea of preparing for a musical performance. So when music enters the film, it's because the characters are performing music. So of course it feels natural. I guess that is one uh, possible answer, right? Create situations where 
the unrealistic elements suddenly become realistic. Uh, I'm thinking here of films like Pitch Perfect uh, or like country music films, films about musicians performing, rock movies, these kinds of things. But then you have like the more, uh, I guess, traditional musical. Um, and like where like the characters are talking and then suddenly they start singing for no reason. And I think that if this kind of musical manages to create realism, if it manages to invite us into their world, it's probably because they have successfully found a high emotional point. When in daily life do we sometimes feel like singing or dancing, even if we don't actually do it? It's usually when we're feeling very strong emotions. It could be positive emotions, uh, like romance and love. We'll talk about that in week 18. It could be negative emotions when we feel like despair and hopeless. Some musicals also give us uh, singing characters in those moments. It could be strong moments of violence, violent emotions, all sorts of emotional high points. So when the music comes into the movie, it it's not realistic, but it feels like it's a reflection of the character's inner state. It expresses what they are feeling inside. And so for the audience, for us, we're more easy to accept the use of singing and dancing in these moments. So even though it is not a realistic element, it is still able to be encompassed. It is tolerated by uh, the realism of the film. It doesn't break our sense of realism. Um, I should mention at this point that another very similar idea to the realism we're talking about here is what's known as the suspension of disbelief. And the idea is everybody knows we're just looking at a screen where people walk around and do things. Like nobody actually thinks that when we watch a movie, we're actually entering into uh, an entirely different world. And yet there are different experiences of, of watching movies. If it's a good movie, we often uh, feel like uh, we are entirely within the situation. We don't really think about the idea that this is all fake, this is all acting. But in a bad movie, those filmmaking elements start being becoming more noticeable. Suddenly you realize, wait, that's not a person, that's an actor. Those lines don't really mean anything, they're just words. Or like, wait, that's not really a submarine, that's a stage. Those kinds of ideas. Uh, and so when it's a good enough movie and we forget about all the filmmaking elements, that is called the suspension of disbelief. We no longer disbelieve in what the film is showing us. It's not exactly the same as the realism I'm talking about here today. There are some films that have a storybook quality or a fable quality. It feels like somebody is telling you the story. And yet it is still suspending disbelief. We're not looking at it as a movie. We're looking at it as somebody telling us a story. So it's similar, but it's not entirely the same. OK, so we talked about like superheroes. We talked about musicals. And then of course there is the big one. Animation. Donghua. Now, I know some people who say that 
they never watch animated movies because. And they say it's because it there it's all fake. It's all drawings and CGI. There's no real humans. And the idea here is that for some people, it's harder for them to suspend disbelief in an animation. So for people who can treat animated movies as just another kind of movie, for people who can get involved in a good animated film and can feel like they're part of that world and they care about the characters and they care about what's going to happen to these animated people. Why? And this question is even bigger when we think about the fact that there are so many different styles of animation. Right, there's Japanese animation, there's Pixar animation because uh, there's traditional Disney animation. So many different kinds of uh, so many different ways of portraying humans and their environment and uh, their actions and behavior. And yet most people can still treat these various different styles as if they were just like a movie with real actors acting in them. Why? Well, we can start thinking about this from the point at which the animated film is real. In other words, the voice acting, the actors who give voice to the characters. For those, you actually do have to get somebody into a sound booth and, and record what they say. So that is a real part, probably the so-called realist part of an animated film. Uh, it's a realist, it's a realist. Uh, 真实的, the most real. But if you think about it, voice acting in animation is also different from general acting or even just ordinary speech. When someone is a voice actor, because we can't see their full human face, even when we do look at like an animation drawing, we can't see their actual human face. We lose most of the communication of body language. And so the voice actor has to make up for that with a more expressive voice. The best voice actors ca uh, can modulate, which means modify by minuscule degrees. There's a yung can modulate their voice so well that a slightly different tone can convey a completely different emotion. When we're talking about acting, we I mentioned line delivery, how an actor says their words. For a voice actor, this is all that they have. This is their entire tool set is how do they speak? So the best voice actors have a wide range of expression in order to convey various different emotions and reactions to various different situations. So even that part is not exactly realistic. It's sort of we might call this a hyper realism. It has too much realism and that makes up for the lack of realism in the image, what we see on the screen. As for what we do see on the screen, uh, animated people and animated environments. I think we can also look at this from two different aspects. If you watch a 3D animation like Pixar, the way that um, I think I'm jumping too far ahead, that'll be the animation part of the lecture, but the idea is that uh, the way that 3D animation is created allows for a more realistic environment. Whereas for a 2D animation, it's just like um, comics or pictures that can move. And 
uh, there we have to use more imagination in terms of spatial awareness, uh, the use of space, use of layers, directions, angles, that kind of thing. Uh, so 3D animation has a bit more of an advantage in creating realism. But in both cases, just like for a fantasy movie, everything on screen has to be created from scratch. And in this case, that includes the actor. How do you design the character? How do they look like? How big are they? What shape are they? How do they move? All of that has to be designed from zero, from the very beginning. And so the use of design for the characters and for the environment will help to determine the level of realism or irrealism. If a character does not move very much, think you can think here of a traditional TV cartoon, then there will be less of a sense of realism. It looks more like what we traditionally think of as a cartoon. Uh, but if the movements are more fluid, if the character, uh, I'll talk about character later. If the movements are more fluid and uh, for example, the face fits the voice acting better. We are more likely to believe in what is going on and to accept that this is actually possible. Uh, yes, yeah, so characters. As I'm sure you know, in cartoons, characters don't always have to be human. But in order to create a sense of realism, they have to have human-like qualities especially for the face, facial expressions. For all of the notable emotions that the characters have to express, we should be able to see those emotions more or less on their face. If the face is not expressive and instead it's the body using gestures and body language that conveys this kind of emotion, it is less nuanced, and then you get something like uh, miming. Miming is the kind of clown who doesn't talk. Uh, I can't remember what this is called in Chinese. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yaju. That's what I found online. It, it'll be kind of be like miming, right? Where you only can use the body and the face has been painted over. Um, and so because of that connection, uh, without facial expressions, the realism is quite weak. We don't really feel invited into the story. We're just looking at the story. And this also applies to things like uh, we mentioned last week, like slapstick comedy. Because it's so bodily and physical, it weakens, it weakens the sense of realism. So even in an animation, if you can create more nuanced facial expressions, it would add to the sense of realism as well. And then we can talk about the background and environment. For a 3D animation, there is no difference. The background is the environment. Anything in the background, as soon as you change the camera angle, will suddenly become part of the environment. But for a 2D animation, the environment is what the character interacts with, and the background is what the character does not interact with. Uh, we have a real, we have an example from a live action film. If you remember Certain Women, the Western film set in rural, uh, I guess, Northwest US, there are lots of shots of like mountains and wide open spaces and prairies. 
but the actors don't interact with those parts. So in an animation, we would call that the background. What the actors do interact with are like doors, buildings, horses, the immediate environment, trucks, restaurants. Those would be the environment because the actor is inside those spaces interacting with those elements. In an animation, um, there, the difference is more noticeable. In every 2D animation, every shot, there will be things that move and things that don't move. We can say that the things that don't move are the background and the things that do move are part of the environment. I remember when I was a kid, I was watching. Uh, I like to watch TV. I love TV. I don't like TV anymore. I watched too much as a kid. Um, but one of the shows I watched was Scooby Doo. You know, the four people, four teenagers and the talking dog solving crimes. Uh, and that cartoon, I noticed something very strange. Some parts of the image were lighter than others. Some parts were darker than others. And I noticed that the lighter parts of the image would move, but the darker parts would never move. So when a shot began, I could tell what was going to happen based on which parts of the image were dark and which parts of the image were lighter. And that's also a way to explain the difference between background and environment. Uh, OK, so those are just some of my thoughts on irrealism. Wait, hang on, I haven't finished. Background and environment. So. When we think about realism, I think it's probably more important to think about realism with the environment. We can say that the realism in an animated film originates in the voice actor and it flows through or it infects, if you like, the character and anything that the character interacts with and therefore the environment. So if where the character is, the immediate environment and the objects and props that the character interacts with, if these don't feel like they fit the world of the film, if they don't feel realist, then it's easy at that point to lose the sense of realism. But I think the background is probably less important for this. The character never interacts with the background. It's just there. It's like the when you're on a, a Zoom call, right? And you're you're uh, talking to somebody else and you have your camera on and you put up a fake background picture. It's just like that. You don't interact with it. And so very quickly the audience forgets that it's supposed to be part of the film world. It instead simply uh, gives us information about where we are and that's it. Right, so if you think about the different pictures you can choose for your Zoom background or your Teams background, uh, it could be like when you go online and look for background pictures, you'll, you, you will often see categories, right? Study, shufang, office, living room, outer space, whatever. Uh, that is the function of an animated background, just simply to tell the audience in general what kind of place we are in. And so if it doesn't move and it's not important for the character and it doesn't interact with the story, then its effect on realism versus irrealism will be weaker. And so sometimes for animated films, there will be no background. Like I only recently noticed this. Recently means within the last two or three years. For some animated films in certain scenes, instead of a background, it just uses a color. And that's it. Nothing behind. We're only entirely focused on the character and the objects that the character interacts with. 
And I think that um, for animated films in particular, they can get away with having no background because we are so focused on the foreground changing. We don't really care what's in the background. So as long as, for example, the color that they choose fits the emotion of the scene. If it's an angry scene, it's a red background. Like uh, if if the scene is like set in the middle of nature, it's a green background, that kind of thing. As long as it kind of fits with the idea of what's going on, we viewers kind of just take it. We let it go. We don't question that part. But of course, you can't uh, do an entire animated film like that. And still preserve a sense of realism all the way through. It's kind of like the use of musicals. Uh, in musicals, the use of song and dance only at specific moments. So if we think about realism from last week and irrealism from this week, it seems that the common uniting idea that puts these two together, the starting point for how we think about these things, is character. Last week we talked about the perspective of a specific character. This week we have been talking about the difference between what a character uh, interacts with and what the character does not really care about. And when we've been analyzing the use of irrealism in realist films, we've always come back to the same idea. Does it matter to the character at that moment? For musicals, song and dance, they are so much in their feelings, right? There's, they feel so much that they don't really care about the outside world. Same for animation. If it doesn't relate to the character and its environment, then at specific moments, you can ignore realism altogether. And so if uh, we wanted to conclude this semester, remember this was supposed to be the final lecture, uh, if we wanted to conclude this semester with a specific idea, I think that idea might be that film, cinema, and storytelling in general work best when they have humans and human concerns at their heart at their center. Doesn't really have to be humans, right? You can make a nature documentary, but even in a nature documentary, uh, usually you will have some kind of story. The bears want to go from A to B. The mother bear takes care of the, the children, right? It, they, it, these are concepts that are central to human life. Um, and so I think that is where the power of most storytelling comes from. So if in the future you have the chance to write a story, to make a movie, to do anything creative, try to keep that in mind. What are the human ideas and concerns of whatever you're doing? OK, that is the irrealism speculative lecture. Do you have ideas you want to add or do you have questions? OK, next we're going to be actually talking about animation. And now as I just foreshadowed, we can split animation into 2D and 3D animation. The, the way that these two are created are completely different. Let's start with 3D. 3D animation, when you use a computer to make 3D imagery, you don't draw everything from the beginning for every scene. What you do is you program the computer to have a kind of physics engine, to have laws of physics uh, that govern how animated objects connect and interact. Then you build those objects. Uh, 
you create an object called a human, you create an object called a ball, and then these two objects, if your physics definitions are good enough, they will interact in a way that feels realistic. So really 3D animation is much closer to live action acting and filmmaking, with the big difference being that instead of having physical objects, uh, even in like live action filmmaking, sometimes you have to make those objects. Um, but in 3D animation, you have to make every object, including the characters. And so one um, issue in this process is attention to detail. When you have like a real person on a real film set, you don't really have to worry too much about like, how will their clothing move in space? Will the hair seem realistic? That kind of thing. You have to worry a little, but you don't have to think too much. When you make a 3D animation, you have to program specific physical rules for all of these details. Uh, so that's why some animated films, even when you watch them, they don't feel like they're groundbreaking. They don't feel like masterpieces. But in the world of animation, uh, they are groundbreaking for technology reasons. For example, you may have heard of a Pixar movie called Tangled. The story, the princess has really long hair. That film was groundbreaking because the animators came up with a new and more accurate way to animate long hair and the different things that hair can do in space. Uh, another film which maybe you haven't heard of is uh, Hotel Transylvania. Now, one of those sequels, there, there are many of them, I can't remember which sequel, but one of those sequels OK, if you don't know this film, Hotel Transylvania is Dracula and his family of monsters open a hotel. Uh, so in one of the sequels. Again, like these are not like exactly great films, but in one of the sequels, it was also groundbreaking because in that film, the animators came up with a way to make the characters move. Very, very fast and yet still look realistic. In a live action movie, when Tom Cruise runs across the screen, you don't have to worry, does it look realistic? Because it's a real person running across a real space. But for animation, everything begins from scratch. You have to draw and design everything. So making these people move quickly and realistically was a big achievement. Now. When we move over to 2D animation, things get a bit stranger. Instead of building physics and environments, uh, which is very similar to how we think about real life, in 2D animation, you have layers. You draw the background, then you draw the midground, then you draw the foreground, then you draw the characters. You put each layer. Uh, well, in the old days, you would put each layer on a plate of glass. And then you arrange them in the correct combination and you photograph it from uh, the top. Like, and so when you photograph it, it all comes together in a single image. Then in the next image, uh, you draw the same thing. Oh, if nothing changes, you can reuse the picture. But if a character moves or an object moves, you have to redraw that part of the image with a slight difference from the previous image and then put the glass plates together again and photograph again. So you can see how in traditional animation shit was hard, man. Like it took a lot of time and effort and collaboration between animators. Now today it's slightly easier because we have computers. So instead of actually physically drawing every image and then putting it on glass, you can either draw it and scan it, or you can draw it in the computer directly, and you can add these layers together in the computer. 
it still takes a lot of time and effort. It's just slightly faster. Uh, and so in 2D animation, the principle of movement is the same as in live action filmmaking. Remember, in live films, images are captured by the film camera at 24 pr frames per second. Every second, the movie camera takes 24 pictures. And so when you look at the film negative, right? 那个胶卷, 底片, it's basically one photograph after another photograph after another. It's because the there are small differences between each photo that when you run them together and you display them one after the other very quickly, it gives the illusion of movement. It looks like things are moving. This is the exact same principle as in 2D animation. Picture after picture with small differences, and when you run them together very quickly, it looks like things are moving. So when you design an animation, each image, we, we've been talking about the elements of each individual image, but movement is defined, is determined by the degree of difference between each image. Uh, the classic example here is if you want to move a character's arm from uh, next to their leg up into the air. Depending on how fast you want them to move it, you can use 40, 50 images. You can use 10 or 20 images. Or for the really fast kind, you can use like five or six images. You usually don't want to use just one or two images because that it's too fast and the human eye cannot really keep up with that kind of movement. It looks like exactly what it is, which is one moment it's down, next moment it's up. It doesn't look like movement. Um, but therefore, instead of asking an actor to move faster or slower, to change speed, you would ask the animators to add more images in between or to take out some of those images. But when you ask an animator to add images, that means they have to redraw a certain part of that image. So really it takes a lot more work to adjust uh, animated movement. Uh, and we have previously talked about um, in special effects, how the studios who do special effects are often overworked and underpaid because the model of payment is unfair to the studios. Um, the production studio tells the, anim the special effects studio what they want for how many scenes. And this is one project. The special effects studio gets paid once for each project. No matter how many changes the production studio asks for, no matter how late the special effects studio receives the film for them to begin work, their contract is fixed. Deadline cannot change, payment will not change. So it's deeply unfair. The same thing applies to animation studios. If animation studios are working together or they're working for a production company, they often don't have the freedom to uh, adjust the deadline. Uh, and so you often have the situation where as the film nears its release date, animators start working later and later. They sleep in their office, they skip lunch and dinner, that kind of thing. Uh, the only thing that is slightly better is that because animators usually work for the same production company that is making the movie, right? They're not outside, they're in house. in-house. So they do receive uh, proportional pay. They're in-house. 
but it's still a very unhealthy working environment. Uh, and so uh, the consensus is if you want to make uh, animation for big production companies, it will take a lot of work, even though there are many more animators. Whereas if you want to work at your own pace and have like a healthier life, you can expect less money and smaller movies. Um, anyway, so that's my uh, lecture on animation. Do you have questions? OK, finally, let me introduce this week's film, The Emperor's New Groove. This is a Disney film, although it completely does not feel like a Disney film. The making of this film was so controversial for Disney. There was a documentary about how this film was made, and it was so bad for Disney's image that Disney banned the documentary. Today, you there is no legal way to watch that documentary. Although if you do want to watch it, I can give you a source. Why was it controversial? Because when you think of a Disney animated film, it's usually very wholesome. Right? People growing up, learning lessons, making friends, saving the world. This movie is about an ancient Incan prince, Jia Wangzi who is very selfish and is punished by being turned into a llama, Nima. He's supposed to learn the lesson of not being selfish, right? And I guess he kind of does, but in between, there are so many absurd, hilarious, evil things that happen, uh, and just like crazy jokes that make no sense. It doesn't fit together like any other Disney film. Uh, so yes, this is a di it's technically a Disney anim 2D animation. It has music, it has comedy, it has excellent voice acting, and it's also kind of short. It's like 75, 80 minutes. Um, so I guess what I want to say is enjoy. And when you watch it, there will be many, many opportunities to think about the questions of realism and irrealism. OK, do you have questions about the film? OK. So uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then when we come back, uh, you can begin watching the film. <laughs> 